Welcome to you all to this MOOC's online video course, Theory of Yarn Structure. Today we will start module 3, Relations among Yarn Count, Twist and Diameter. As you all know, the relations among yarn count, twist and diameter are related to specific geometrical and mechanical properties of yarns. The basic quantity which is underlying this relationship is called packing density. The fiber packing density in yarn basically decide this relationship among yarn count, yarn twist and yarn diameter. The first traditional model regarding this relationship was established by Cochlin. in the year 1828. So, you can imagine this concept is quite old. Now, in the year of 1828, <coughs> the specific regulations in yarn structure, especially the mechanics of fibrous assembly inside yarn was not well known. The, the specific tensors, stress, stress ten, tensor in yarn was also not well known. So, Cochlin introduced a few basically two important assumptions. As those relationships were unknown in the year of 1828, Cochlin introduced two assumptions. The first assumption Packing density is a function of twist intensity only. So, this was the first assumption of Cochlin, packing density is a function of twist intensity only. So, symbolically mu packing density is a function of yarn twist intensity kappa, where kappa is equal to pi times d times z. So, this was the first assumption of Cochlin. Now, let us analyze the consequence of this assumption. Consequence of first assumption. We will discuss with twist coefficients or twist multiplier and diameter multiplier. So, the question is what are the consequence of Cochlin's first assumption on twist coefficient or twist multiplier and diameter multiplier. So, we will answer to this question now. First, let us start with twist coefficient. First twist coefficient as we know 
that alpha s z root over s and alpha is equal to z root over t. So, these two relationships we learned in module 2, right. Now, what is s? s is the substance cross sectional area of yarn. So, that is pi d square by 4 into mu. This relation also we learnt in module 2. So, let us write this expression pi right. Now, this pi d z this quantity d is equal to kappa twist intensity. So, we can write this expression further as kappa times mu 2 root pi. Now, look at this carefully twist intensity kappa 2 root over pi is a constant this is a constant right and root over mu. Now, we assumed packing density is a function of twist intensity only. So, we can write kappa function of kappa and 2 root pi this function f is right now unknown. Okay. So, this was the related to twist coefficient. Second twist coefficient let us see z. Now, t we know that t is d square pi mu rho by 4 right. So, we can further write this as pi d times z into pi right. Now, what is pi d z? Pi d z is kappa. So, we can write kappa by 2 root over pi. Okay. Now, mu is a function of twist intensity only. So, we can write kappa function of kappa rho by 2 into pi. Okay. So, these were the consequences of Cochlin's first assumption on twist coefficient. Now, we will analyze the consequence of first assumption on diameter multiplier. But before that what we see here is alpha subscript s is a function of kappa only right and alpha is also a function of kappa only because fiber density is assumed to be constant because Cochlin studied yarns produced from same fibrous material using same technology for analogical end users. So, that is why rho 
same fibrous material was used, so rho is constant here. So, that means what we see is that alpha s as well as alpha both twist coefficients are functions of kappa only. Now, let us proceed to the consequence of first assumption on diameter multiplier. Now, diameter multiplier. Two relations we learned in module 2 regarding diameter multiplier d is equal to k times root s. Second, what we learned is d is equal to k times root t. So, these two relations we already learned in module 2, right. So, what we see here k s d by root s, what is s let us substitute pi d square by 4 into mu, right. So, this d d will cancel out and what we will see is 2 root over pi into mu, right. Now, mu is a function of twist intensity only. So, we write 2 by pi this function. Look, 2 is a constant, pi is a constant, function of twist intensity that means, k s is a function of twist intensity only. What happens to k? So, k is d by root t is not it. Now, what is t? Let us write So, what we see here is 2 this d d will cancel out and as a result you will get this expression is not it. Now, 2 by root over pi function of twist intensity only into rho. So, what we see here 2 constant pi is another constant rho same fibrous material. So, rho is constant. So, diameter multiplier d is also a function of twist intensity only. So, if we summarize these two results, then what we obtain is twist coefficients as well as diameter multipliers are functions of twist intensity. So, this statement is the consequence of Cochlin's first assumption. All right. Now, we introduce Cochlin's second assumption.
Another very interesting assumption was introduced by Coquelin. What was that? The twist intensity of yarns with different counts. is same. Look at this second assumption of Cochlein. The twist intensity of yarns with different counts is same. That means, and as I told you earlier, Cochlein used same fibrous material he used same technology for yarn production and those yarns were of same analogical induce apparel induce Right, and Cochlin's second assumption was the twist intensity of yarns with different counts is same. So that means <coughs> that means twist intensity is same. Then what happens to our consequences? Let us see now. So, this was the consequence of first assumption. Now, we will analyze the consequence of both assumptions. Alpha s was a function of twist intensity only and twist intensity of yarns with different fineness is same. So, alpha s is same for all yarns. Similarly, first assumption told alpha is a function of twist intensity only and second assumption told twist intensity is same for all yarns. So, alpha is same for all yarns right. Then what happens to diameter multiplier? K s is a function of twist intensity only and twist intensity is same for all yarns. So, K s is same for all yarns. Similarly, K is a function of twist intensity only and twist intensity is same for all yarns. So, K is same for all yarns. That means, what we see is that alpha s is a constant alpha is a constant right k s is a constant k is a constant they are same for all yarns that means Finally, if they are same for all yarns, then mu packing density for all yarn is same. Packing density is same for all yarns. This is not correct. Why? 
why? Because we know packing density ranges from 0 0.38 to roughly 0 0.55. So, packing density is not same for all yarns, experimentally we have analyzed it and we observed that packing density ranges from 0 0.38 carded yarn to 0 0.55 for combed yarn. Why is it so? What went wrong in Cochrane's assumption? Let us now analyze these two assumptions once again. Cochlin's second assumption twist intensity of yarns with different count is same that means, kappa is pi times d times z is constant right. Now, as for our experience on yarn manufacturing is concerned, this assumption is probably not too far from reality. When we insert higher twist, yarn becomes more compact and diameter reduces. So, z is increasing. d is decreasing, pi is constant. So, probably kappa is constant is not a too bad assumption. Then what went wrong? Let us then come back to first assumption, Cochlin's first assumption Packing density is a function of twist intensity only. Twist intensity is not a function of packing density only, it depends on yarn count too. So, probably this assumption, Cochlin's first assumption, was not too real. So, that is why empirical corrections to Cochlin's equation were necessary and many scientists, researchers worked on yarn structure proposed different corrections to Cochlin's expression. Let us see those empirical corrections to Cochlin's expression. So, now we would like to see empirical corrections to Cochlin's theory. Now, if we generalize those corrections, then we will see that suitable yarn twist as per those scientists who proposed different corrections Z alpha by t to the power q. So, this much twist is required to give yarn. Now, alpha you know twist coefficient or twist multiplier t to the power q. Now, these scientists who propose different corrections, empirical corrections to Cochlin's theory, they propose different values of q. Say, let us summarize those say author 
Cochlean hymns first and probably in the year if you look at 1828, he proposed the value of Q 0 0.5, right. Then there was another researcher who worked on yarn structure stub in 1900, he proposed a value 0 0.6. Remember these values came from experimental results, they are empirical. Then there was another scientist Johansen. In 1902, he proposed a value 0 0.644. Then there were many important fricks. In 1942, he proposed 2 by 3. This then Nest curves in 1971, he published a research article where he mentioned the value of Q ranging from 0 0.577, 0 0.6, like that. So, there were many, we could list 5 here. So, what we see is that there are two trends. The first trend is different researchers proposed empirical corrections to Cochlean's theory. So, the value of Q is different according to different researchers. Second, which is interesting, all the values of Q, if you look at them, you will see that all the values are greater than equal to 0.5 not a single value till date proposed by any researcher falls below 0 0.5. So, they are higher than 0 0.5 or else Cochlean proposed it is equal to 0 0.5. So, this is a very interesting trend. As a student of theory of yarn structure, you should basically look at those results and then start thinking why is this happening, why all the values are greater than 0.5, why not, not a single value falls below 0 0.5. So, this gives you inspiration for future research. So, you have to think critically and analytically. All right. So, these were the empirical corrections to Cochlean's theory. Now, problem with empirical corrections is that if we use different yarns say yarns from different fibers or say yarns with different technologies ring spinning technology, roto spinning technology, yard jet yarn manufacturing technology. So, if we use different technologies or different fibrous materials the value of Q will be different but this value of Q is required for yarn production, is not it? Then how will you predict before producing the yarn, what should be the value of Q? Accordingly, I will set the yarn manufacturing technology process parameters. So, it is very much necessary to predict the value of Q in this case before production of the yarn, but all relations are empirical. So, that is well, that was probably the necessity of a theoretical model which can propose 
a theoretical scientific relation among yarn count, yarn twist and yarn diameter. Such a model exists. So, but it is a theoretical model as typically happens every theoretical model is based on certain assumptions certain hypothesis then the equations are derived and then finally final results are compared with experimental ones so here we will describe one theoretical model which accounts for a relationship among yarn count, yarn twist and yarn diameter. So, we will start with certain assumptions, we will develop mathematical equations until we achieve the final one and we will show you the comparison of the final theoretical expressions with experimental results. So, it will take quite a long time. Let us name this model as a simple mechanical model. This model is based on a few assumptions. The primary assumptions, the four primary assumptions I will write down also while deriving relationships we will introduce a few more assumptions. First assumption all fibers have helical shape. So, a yarn consists of many fibers and inside the yarn the fibers follow helical pattern, helical shape all fibers follow helical pattern. Second assumption all helixes have a common axis that is yarn axis. So, all the helixes have a common axis that is yarn axis. Third, all helixes have same sense of rotation, same direction of rotation. So, they are not randomly follow rotation, they have a same sense, same direction of rotation. Fourth, basically it is a direction of twist. <coughs> Fourth, As a result of helical path fiber coil will be developed. So, each fiber coil has same height. Right, these are all primary assumptions. The fifth assumption is a very important one. This assumption is packing density is same at all places inside a yarn. Look at this fifth assumption. What do we say? 
we say that in one yarn packing density is same at all places. Mind it we do not say that packing density of all yarns is same, we are not saying that. What we are saying is that in one particular yarn packing density will be same at all places inside the yarn. Right? So, these 5 are the initial assumptions. Now, we will start developing this model. Look at this image a cylindrical yarn, one fiber coil is shown here, this on the surface. So, you see it inside dotted you do not see and then again it comes on the surface you see it right. D is the diameter of the yarn and R is the radius at which the fiber is present. And if we draw a tangent along this line this tangent makes an angle beta from yarn axis. So, beta is twist angle of a general fiber right. Now, if you unroll this cylinder the thick cylinder then what you will see is that this distance will be 2 pi r this will be 1 by z because z is the number of coils per unit length. So, the length will be 1 by z and this angle is beta. So, you can understand tangent of beta is equal to 2 pi r times z. Okay. Now, <coughs> this fiber trajectory is a basically curve. So, what will be the first curvature? We know from simple mechanics the first curvature k 1 is equal to sin square this angle beta by radius r right then what will be radius of curvature radius of curvature is 1 by curvature right so r by sin square beta right. So, this expression we will require later on radius of curvature is equal to r by sin square beta. What is the beta? Beta is the twist angle at radius r and r is radius. Okay. Now, let us because of the twist lot of forces are generating some forces are acting along the fiber some forces are centripetal in nature so we would like to study the centripetal force per unit volume of fiber so what is the amount of centripetal force which is generated because of twist or twist insertion per unit volume of fiber. So, we like to find out this amount. 
So, what do you do for that? We take one small element of fiber U V. This is U, this point is V. So, we take a small element U V. The same element is shown here U and V. This element we are talking about this element. Okay. Now, so this is fiber element. So, there is one force which is acting along the fiber that force is F. So, U V is basically fiber element a small element U V. We would like to derive an expression for centripetal force per unit volume of this U V. And what is F? F is fiber axial force. Okay. And what is d phi? d phi is the elementary angle. So, here you can see d phi is the elementary angle and r k is the radius of curvature. Right. So, d phi is elementary angle. Okay. What more you see in this image? Yarn diameter d. Now, one interesting you can see that there is something grey color. So, this grey color cylinder basically a cylinder where we will see later on some significant compression of fibrous assembly happens because of twist. So, this cylinder is situated at a distance from r plus a by 2 and r minus a by 2 these two ready right. Okay, beta you already know twist angle. All right. Now, yeah, one more symbol is not known to you that is called, called dp. Dp, look at this direction of the force, dp is acting here towards S. So, dp is the centripetal force. dp is We need to find out centripetal force per unit volume of fiber. So, first we have to find out dp, then we have to find out the volume of uv, then we will divide, we will find out dp by that volume ratio, right. So, we, we will achieve to achieve our target. Now, what is dp? If you look at this one, then what you see is that d p is equal to 2 times f sin d phi by 2. If you analyze this simple mechanical analysis, you will find out d p is equal to 2 times f into sin d phi by 2. Now, it is an elemental angle, d phi is an elemental angle, it is very small. So, when theta is small sin theta is equal to theta. So, when d phi is small sin d phi by 2 is equal to d phi by 2. So, if we write that 2 f d phi by 2 finally, we find out f into d phi. So, centripetal force is equal to fiber axial force multiplied by elementary angle. Okay. Good. Now, find out the volume because what is our target? Our target is to find out an expression for centripetal force per unit volume. 
So, if we find out volume and if we divide this expression by that volume, we will obtain our result. So, volume of u v we need to find out. How will you find out volume? Volume is simple, radius of curvature into d phi into s, s is fiber cross sectional area, is not it? So, radius of curvature we have already known <coughs> from our earlier one that is r by sin square beta. So, if we write r by sin square beta into d phi and s is fiber cross sectional area right. So, let us write s here ok. Remember s small s is fiber cross sectional area, we learnt it in module 1 right. So, now centripetal force per unit volume let us write P 1 centripetal force per unit volume. So, P 1 is defined by d P by this volume we can write it as d v small volume d v right. So, what is d p? d p is f d phi here and what is d v? d v is here r d phi into s by sin square beta right. So, if we rearrange it then what we see is that let us do it once again p 1 is equal to f sin square beta into d phi divided by r into s into d phi right. So, d phi d phi will cancel out and we obtain f sin square beta by r into s right. So, we wanted to find out an expression for centripetal force per unit volume of fiber and we obtained it. So, this is our desired expression P 1 centripetal force per unit volume of fiber is equal to fiber axial force sin square beta. What is beta? Beta is twist angle r, r is the radius of yarn and s is fiber cross sectional area. Okay. Right. Now, this model what we are going to study is based on idea of compressing zone. When we insert twist fibers in certain region inside the urn are significantly compressed. why certain region? Because same amount of compression is not happening throughout inside the urn. Why? Think about around the urn surface packing density is very small, number of fiber to fiber contact is very small, frictional forces are very small. So, f will be very small. So, P 1 will be very small. 
So, what we say is that there will be one significantly compressed zone inside the iron structure. Where is that? Where is that located at? That is our question now. Around yarn surface, it cannot be. This cannot be present around yarn surface. Why? Because packing density, number of fiber to fiber contact. frictional forces are small. So, F is small. So, P 1 is small. So, this compression zone cannot be present around yarn surface. Can it be present then around yarn core? Around yarn core, it also cannot be present. Why? Around yarn core, fibers are more or less straight. So, beta angle beta is very, very small. As a result, curvature is also very small. So, P 1 is small. That means, around the yarn core, beta is too small. So, P 1 is very small. So, the significantly compressed zone can neither be present around the yarn core nor be present around the yarn surface. So, where it can be located at? Let us assume that this significantly compression zone, what we are talking about, is present somewhere in between yarn core and yarn surface. So, let us then say that this gray color region is the region of cylinder where significantly compression zone is present. It is not at core nor at surface, it is in between. So, we assume that because of twist fibers will be significantly compressed and this significantly compression zone is present at a distance from yarn as a distance in between r plus a by 2 and r minus a by 2 these two ready length of the cylinder is still remains l. So, what is the cross sectional area of this compression zone? basically this gray color region. This is equal to pi r plus a by 2 square minus pi r minus a by 2 square is not it. Okay. So, this pi is common pi now expand it r square plus r a plus a square by 4 minus r square plus r a minus 
x square by 4. So, what we see is that this r square and r square cancel out, then this s square by 4 and s square by 4 cancel out. So, we find r a and r a. So, that is equal to 2 times pi r a, right? Very simple expression. So, what is the cross sectionality of the compressing zone? Is 2 times pi times r into a. A is the thickness of the compression zone. Okay. Then, what is the volume of this compressing zone? Simple. What is the volume? Cross sectional area into length, length is L, cross sectional area is 2 pi r a. So, volume is 2 times pi times r a L. Now, this is the volume of compressing zone. What is the volume of fiber in this compressing zone? Volume of fibers. in the compressing zone. Volume of fibers in the compressing zone divided by volume of the compressing zone is equal to packing density. Right? So, volume of fibers in the compressing zone will be 2 pi r a l into mu mu is the fiber packing density in yarn, right. So, what will be total centripetal force? The total centripetal force will be say p. Let us use the symbol p, this is equal to p 1 earlier into this volume V. So, let us write this volume as V A. So, V A. Okay. So, this will be total centripetal force. So, P is equal to P 1 into V A. What is P 1? P 1 we have probably derived earlier right f sin square beta by r into s that is p 1 and what is v a? v a is 2 pi r a l into mu. So, this is the total centripetal force right. If we write it as f this r r will be cancel out. So, how do we obtain f into sin square beta 2 pi a l mu by s. Okay. Now, we need to find out the so, we have found out the total force. Now, we stop here. In the next class, we will start from here and try to find out the pressure developed in this compressing zone. Okay? Thank you. Thank you for your attention.